welcome to what promises to be an awesome evening filled with history, reflections, and direction. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? This is the 11th lecture series sponsored by the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center under the leadership of the Honorable Congresswoman Barbara Lee, whose focus, yeah, okay, you can. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be doing that throughout the evening. Whose focus for the Martin Luther King Center is to empower young people to promote nonviolent principles in the midst of chaos in a peaceful manner to deepen the relationships within the community. The Freedom Center programming promotes academic excellence and civic leadership, developing common good values of interdependence, equity, and global pursuit of ecological sustainability. Our young people are on the move, and they are making a difference in every city, every community, and every state. They have an opportunity to, uh, to go to. This is their beginning of building democracy, and it is your beginning for assisting them <clears throat> for building democracy for our young. As you know, many of us recognize the importance of social justice, but we need to be reminded that many individuals go before us to express the needed work that is required to continue the efforts in this area. And because of this lecture series, we're able to be reminded as well as recognize the remarkable work and sacrifices that these individuals have made. To our distinguished guests, I look forward to hearing the lessons learned about the importance of community organization. Senator Art Torres, through his formal legislative processes, he realized that sometimes it required the creation of laws or the appropriation of dollars through legislation to address the needs of our community. To Dolores Huerta, through her grassroots labor organization. As a working mother, she realized that she had something to be done regarding the remedies that needed to be completed regarding the injustices of working farm workers, including their children. I was one of those children in the fields of the Salinas Valley, or Moss Landing, California in the radish and parsley fields. As a member that I recognized that there were women that could speak up in a strong voice, allowed me to continue the pursuit of my education to gain this position. So Dolores, Barbara, and L.U., Art, you continue to be my role models. And I know that there is no such thing as retirement, right? <laughs> you continue to pursue. And I think our community here is demonstrating that they want to know and they are here to do the work. And I welcome everybody to tonight's lecture series. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Fernanda Castro. I'm a student of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. On behalf of the Freedom Center, I welcome you all to this evening of sharing history and making history, reflecting on the activism and love for humanity that created a more just society for us today. The Freedom Center gives thanks to those who made this night possible. To Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Elview Harris, thank you for making the lecture series happen. Woo! 
to Dr. Norma Ambris Galavis, president of Merritt College and co-producer of the Barbara Lee and Evu Harris Lecture Series, we thank you for the wonderful partnership. <laughs> to Ms. Dolores Huerta and the Honorable Art Torres, we are honored and grateful to have you here tonight sharing the hope and dedication that you guys have seen and that all of us here will be inspired by. Thank you. Tonight, we share our hope. It is a hope gifted to us by the generation of Art Torres, Dolores Huerta, Eliu Harris, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and many others. It is a hope that all people today, young and old, will take steps toward a world free of injustice. <laughs> For the current generation and all generations to come, the farm workers' struggle for civil rights is our struggle. The struggle towards representation belongs to everyone, regardless of race, gender, age, or sexual orientation. The struggle is not over. Let's accept the challenge of moving forward together. All of us carry within ourselves great strength and power. When we join forces, put all of our hearts, minds, and voices together, we create something beautiful. We create a circle more powerful than the injustices we have faced. We become each other's voice and gain the capacity to be united. Though there is much darkness in the world today, there is also much light and beauty. It is up to us to be the light, to harness the beauty, and to create meaningful change. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Omega AG. I am 15 years old, and I'm a member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center leadership team. There is so much to do in our nation and world today. While much has been accomplished, we can and must reignite the struggle. Tonight, in representing my team members at the Freedom Center, I wish to leave you all with these thoughts. Brothers and sisters, we all go through struggles, big or small. We have all felt the sting of having been done wrong in some form, way, or fashion. We each have roadblocks, distractions, people who dislike us for shallow or selfish reasons. In struggle, there is always going to be someone who tries to put you down to tell you who you are. Still, it is up to you to know who you are and what you are capable of. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we all have strengths. We all have flaws. Each of us have something that we don't like about ourselves. But it's time. 
It's time to accept ourselves as smart, courageous, powerful, and it's time to demand answers to these basic questions. Who will respect me if you do not? Who will love me if you do not? Who will encourage me if you do not? Brothers and sisters, won't you stand up with me? Raised in a time of greed and war, our hearts and minds coming together, shouting, we can change ourselves and we can change the world. Thank you. Good evening. Well, if you're not inspired by now, there's nothing else I could say. <laughs> One of the first people I met when I went to law school was Art Torres. And Art Torres was a third year student, but he had also been a candidate for the legislature. And what he did in law school, no one else had done. He started a law school class as a student on prison law. And he took us to all the prisons in the state of California. I didn't know if it was to make sure we avoided going there <laughs> or to make sure we understand the conditions under which prisoners were living or the fact that rehabilitation is no longer a process or a program in the state of California, thanks to Ronald Reagan. May you rest in peace. <laughs> but Art Torres has always been one of my heroes and one of my mentors because he doesn't just talk to talk, he walks to walk. And when I graduated from law school, within two years, Art Torres, a young lawyer himself, is now in the state legislature. All things are possible. I was working in the legislature, and my mentor, my friend, my fellow law student is now in the legislature. And Art Torres is working for the things he talked about when he was in law school. He is now working to rehabilitate the prison system. He's now working to ensure that farm workers and, and, and minorities and poor people get justice and opportunity in the state of California. Now, growing up in the 60s, I knew what was going on in the civil rights movement, not only in the South, but in Oakland. I saw the Panthers. I saw people who were working and struggling against the powers that be. And I also knew about the farm workers and their struggle, the great boycotts, things that were going on throughout California and throughout the country to give migrant workers, poor people, a chance to have decent living conditions, decent legal and labor rights, and the ability to raise their children with dignity and with the hope of a future. And the people that represented that, that I also had a chance to meet when I first got to the legislature, were the Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. They were rough. No, Dolores was rough. Caesar was really nice. Dolores scared the hell out of you. She walked in the room. Caesar was smiling. Nice to see Dolores. What you going to do? Why are you here? Why are we here talking to you? And you felt like I needed to do something because Dolores is serious. And all the time, she has continued to be serious about her politics, about her people, and about this country doing the right things for the poor, for the farm workers, for minorities, for women, for all those who've been denied equal justice and equal opportunity under law. So having these two people here tonight, representing lives of legacy, lives of achievement, and lives of commitment, to not only mean a lot to me, but hopefully to all of you. Some of you never met them before, but hopefully all of you will not only be inspired by their words, but by their life. So today, I just hope that you understand and we have the chance to not only stand in the shadow of greatness, but to emulate that in our own lives. And that, to me, is the benefit of the lecture series and the benefit of all of you being here. So thank you for coming, and I hope that you enjoy our, and are inspired by this evening. Thank you. I grew up in the city, a Latino in East Los Angeles. But my parents worked in the fields in Fillmore picking oranges. So I knew somewhat from their stories what it was all about, but never experienced what it was really all about. I had never endured discrimination until I worked in the Central Valley of California. 
And then I realized it wasn't a good thing to be a Mexican. And as I experienced that, I got to learn even more about the movement, but most importantly, about so many issues which affect us. And it's where I began my passion with healthcare, because it was Dolores who told me the impact of pesticides on people's lives and health. And I have to report to her, because I have not told her this before, but when I joined as vice chair of the California Stem Cell Agency, a young director of the Department of Health came to me and said, well, because of your law that was passed in the 80s, we registered carcinogens, and now we have developed a causal relationship between pesticide poisoning and autism. And it was Dolores and Caesar who always said, we can't prove it, but we know there's a relationship between cancer and pesticide poisoning. And we know that these chemicals are damaging the lives of people living on farms and in agricultural areas of California. We just can't prove it. Well, now we're finally, finally getting the proof that there is a causal relationship between carcinogens and chemicals and people living or trying to, li to live. But I think also it's important to note just where we are today. I was on the platform at the inauguration of President Barack Obama. I first met him when he was a state senator from Illinois. I knew he had great promise, but I had never dreamed how fast he would move. And I saw hope and change in the faces of the people there at that chilly morning and afternoon, that hope and change was coming to this country. And yet I heard the echoes of those on the other side that, that said they would stop at nothing to make sure that he did not succeed. And the other day I was asked by a, a young man from Mali in Africa, and he asked me at a dinner I was at in Los Angeles last week, and he said, why is there so much vindictiveness? Why is there so much anger by people against this president? I said, the anger doesn't come from a, dis a, a difference in opinion. The anger doesn't come from an intellectual discussion. The anger comes from an internal hatred and racism. That's where it comes from. Those people on the other side are angry that a bright, intelligent, compassionate African-American happens to be the president of the United States. That's where that vitriol is coming from. That's where that anger is coming from. But tonight is about chaos and community, and where are we moving? Yes, we've been in chaos, but one phrase that Caesar always quoted to me was from Gandhi. Without a struggle, there is no movement. Movement will occur when we struggle to ensure that justice prevails. And that can happen in a classroom, that can happen in a community, that can happen on the halls of the Congress or the legislature. All it takes is one act, one simple act of courage and vision to remove injustice from our society. I'm not giving up hope. I'm not giving up on change. And, we, and neither should you. But we are faced with a very serious issue, apathy. Apathy. This last election, only 40% of 17 million registered voters in California actually voted. Dolores has spent her life on voter registration efforts. She knows the value of registering voters. And yet we have potentially here in California, quite frankly, close to 20, uh, 24 million people who are eligible to vote, and only 17 million are registered. And only 40% of that, 7 million, actually voted in November. 59% white people voted, 8% black, 18% Latino, 11% Asian voted. Of the 17 million, that's all that voted. What does that mean? In the national turnout, 75% of voters who are white voted. 12% of black voters voted. 8% Latino voters. 3% Asian, 1% Native American. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. For those of us that believe in nonviolence, for those that believe that a nonviolent approach to achieving our goals and our vision is so important, this is the way to do it. To register people to vote, especially young people, and to get them to the polls. That's where change occurs. 
We've seen today members of Congress who are fighting between 11 and 12 votes still being counted in Sacramento, in Fresno, in, in San Diego, in the Assembly. We see people that are behind by 11 votes who should have been elected overwhelmingly but because people did not go out and vote. They are struggling to survive. And who are these people? These are people that work with Barbara Lee in the Congress that we need their votes. These are the people that work in the legislature that we need their votes. And those votes will not happen in 2016 unless we get our people out to vote and registered. I've often thought about what legacy we leave as leaders. And it is a responsibility for all of us to reflect upon that. And you don't have to be an elected person to be a leader. Each and every one of you are leaders in your home, in your neighborhood, in your communities, and across this state and across this nation. And that responsibility must be taken seriously. And if leadership is going to prevail to cure injustices in our society, then we have to work. And it takes a lot of hard work. And as we move forward between now and 2016, we have to look and ensure that those messages that we take to the people of this state and the people of this nation, that we will not stand to go back again, we cannot afford to go back again, that we have to put everything into our muscle of our brains and our power, and as these young girls said, from their minds, their hearts, and their voices, to bring that beauty and power back to our communities. You have it, we have it, let's do it. This lecture series brings together the great civil rights leaders who I personally have had the chance to and the privilege to work with and to meet, uh, those that Elihu knows, people who inspire and promote social change and justice. And so tonight is no different. Uh, the re after the recent elections, it's so appropriate uh, for tonight's lecture to be called, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And there's no one, no one who can put this into perspective than, to, than Dolores Huerta, because she is a great warrior woman, and she is one of my personal sheroes. Dolores has committed her entire life to the pursuit of social, social justice. Her experiences as a woman, as a Latina, a voice for immigrants and vulnerable communities make her an incredible foot soldier and leader for peace and equality. Peace, foot soldier and leader. I have marched with Dolores over and over and over again. I don't care what the issue is. It could be for women's reproductive health, for excuse me, ensuring that our working men and women have an opportunity to unionize. It could be testifying before con congressional and Senate and assembly committees. Dolores' work has changed the course of our country and improved countless lives. You saw in the video that she founded the Agricultural Workers Association while working for the Stockton Community Service Organization. She set up voter registration drives and fought for improvements in her community. She lobbied for Spanish language voting ballots and driver's tests. Now in 1962, she met Cesar Chavez and they co-founded the National Farm Workers Association. And yes, she was instrumental in the enactment of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act of 1975, which was the first law of its kind in the nation that granted farm workers in California the right to collectively organize and bargain for better wages and working conditions. That is an amazing, in 1975, 1975. Dolores has broken down so many barriers for farm workers and for people everywhere. Even now, and I don't know, Dolores, do you want me to say what your age is? Uh, God, at 84 years of age, my God, 84 years of age, with 11 children, 11, one of her daughters is an alumni of, of Mills. Her energy and her enthusiasm inspires me and gives me hope. She's an incredible force for change. 
And you know, one thing about Dolores, we have to te thank her for teaching us the necessity of building organizations and the know-how to build enduring and disciplined ones dedicated to justice for all. Organization is truly necessary in order to meet the demands of justice and dedicated, disciplined leaders are necessary to build strong organizations. Dolores is a great teacher. She's a tireless organizer. As founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, she travels across the country. She just came back from Boston tonight. Can you believe that? She does this each and every day. Engaging in campaigns and influencing legislation that supports equality and that defends civil rights. Now, you know she's the recipient of many awards and accolades, and rightfully so, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award. In addition, she was inducted into the California Hall of Fame in 2013. Dolores has been a voice for the feminist movement, for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender brothers and sisters, for the LGBT community, for immigration reform, and she truly champions the progressive movement. She and I both know that we've come a long way, you know that, in our fight for social and economic justice, but we still have a long way to go. Dolores has always been a coalition builder. She's been one to bring the African American, the Latino, the white community together with the Asian Pacific American community to fight for justice and equality for all. She has an amazing history. One of the uh, remembrances that I have that always stands out is walking with Dolores uh, in Delano, California at Cesar Chavez's funeral. He, his body was in a beautiful, simple pine box. Uh, Senator Teddy Kennedy was there. Dolores was there. And I looked at Dolores and I said, you know, boy, her partner was no longer with us. And I knew then that that meant she'd have to do double duty. And, and she has stepped up and done double duty and has continued to march and to fight and to be one of those individuals whose legacy not only has been so important for us in the past, but today. When you look at, and I'll close by saying this, you know, when you look at the fact that she was very involved with the, can the candidacy of Jesse Jackson when he ran for president, twice now. She's part of the Rainbow Coalition. But what I always remember is, many people think it was the United Farm Workers that uh, began the, uh, the mantra, si se puede, but it was Dolores Huerta who says, si se puede all the time. And it was because of Dolores Huerta and si se puede that Barack Obama became president because Barack Obama's slogan is si se puede. Yes, we can and yes, he did. Dolores, come on up here now. That Dolores is, si se puede. I think we've heard so much history this evening and, uh, and very appropriate about now, what are we going to do now? You know, we can talk about the victories of the past, but at the same time, uh, we know that many of the victories that we had in the past are totally being eroded and taken away from us. Uh, there have been so many attempts now to suppress uh, voting rights of uh, people of color and of students. Uh, we know by this last election that we just had that who had the big victory? It was uh, the, the Koch brothers, you know, these people that uh, get all of their money from oil and gas and, and uh, have, have, they're worth $40 billion, and so they have all of this money that they can spend on elections. And so we have to think about how can we counter this. And as uh, Senator Torres mentioned, uh, that so many people didn't vote. And we wonder, well, we probably know some of those people ourselves that didn't vote, and we wonder why. And we know because they are so confused and they watch television and they see all of these ads and so many of these people that just lie with these ads that they have out there about uh, different candidates. And so then people just get very discouraged and they don't vote. And then 
Another thing is that they don't have civic education anymore in the schools. Who knew that they do not teach civics in schools anymore? So young people don't even know. They might know something about the Constitution, uh, but they don't know the different departments of government. Uh, they don't know who their uh, civic leaders are, who their representatives are. And so we have this huge ignorance that we have in our society. And so we have a great need for just plain old knowledge. Uh, so how can we counter, how can we counter this crisis that we're in in our country? And if our country is in crisis politically, and if our country is in crisis in education, then I think we, the way that we can counter this is to bring education and community together. I think this is the one way that we can address this uh, because we've got to start by how can we reach out to so many people and to let them know what is happening here in our society, what, what is happening in our country. I, wanted, uh, in, I just want to give you an example of what we're doing uh, with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Uh, I lived at uh, United Farm Workers in the year 2002, and uh, I always had this dream, and Cecil and I had talked about this before, he passed away, about that we thought we were going to be able to build the Farm Workers Union. Uh, we, it, we figured it'll take us about 10 years, and we'll have a national union of farm workers, because we had been so successful right up until about 1973. Uh, you know, we had over 100,000 farm workers under contract here in California. We had farm workers under contract in, uh, in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Florida. And we thought, it'll take us another 10 years. And once we get all the farm workers under co union contracts, we'll go back to community organizing. That dream was not realized because unfortunately in 1973, there was a conspiracy between President Nixon, the head of the Teamsters Union, Frank Fitzsimmons, and Alan Grant, the head of the Farm Bureau Federation. And they came in and they took all of the contracts so the United Farm Workers away. So that didn't happen. But when after Caesar passed away, I thought, at that point in time, I thought, we've got to put the union in the hands of younger leadership because leadership is something that can't be transferred through osmosis. It's something that you have, to, you have to live it, you have to do it to build that kind of strength that you need to be a leader. And so we decided to place the, the, the United Farm Workers in the hands of Arturo Rodriguez, who is the president of the, union, of the union today. And so then what I did, I said, I'm gonna go back to community organizing. Going back to show people that they have power and that they can make the changes that they need. And so with my foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, this is what we've done. We've gone back and we're going back to many uh, recent immigrants and getting them together, teaching them how they can come together and how they can make the differences in their community. And we did a lot of work on infrastructure. You know, people learn how to, to bring in uh, sidewalks and curbs and gutters and street lights and swimming pools, neighborhood parks into uh, their communities. But then we found something out. There was something really bad happening in education. And we found out that in our area, in Kern County, we had the largest high school district in the, in the, in the state of California. It's 40,000 students in one high school district. But in that high school district, they had suspended close to 3,000 students. And you're probably not surprised if I tell you this, most of them were African-American and Latino, the vast majority. And so we thought, this is so wrong. And they were suspending them for, I mean, idiotic reasons, because they talked back to a security guard on the school ground, or they talked back to a teacher. So we decided we would change that. So we did, using that same method that Fred Ross, the great Fred Ross Sr., who taught Cecil and myself how to organize, meeting with the families in their homes meeting with each family, four or five people, six people, and until we could meet with 200 people. And then we brought them all together. Our first parent conference, we had 155 parents that showed up. And then they came up with their statements about what was happening to their children. And then uh, we, uh, of those parents, and we got 40 of them, and we uh, trained them how to be advocates for their, for their children, how to get to keep the kids in school, and, and how to fight to get them back into school. And then we started with a school board. No avail. These, these people in that area, they are so racist, I have to say the word, and so homophobic. In fact, one of the members of the school board made a statement that all gays should be burned at the stake. I mean, that's how extreme they are. So uh, this is what we're doing. 
And uh, so we're organizing parents, organizing the students to fight the system. And then, of course, we're trying to get some of, some of our people to get, uh, take over the school board. But I do believe that this is, I think, the basis of so much what is, that is wrong in our society is people that are just plain ignorant. I have to say the word. They're plain ignorant and they don't really know. So what do we do? We have to get out there and we have to reach those people. And when we think of the threat that we have to our democracy, there was a Spanish philosopher named Jose Ortega y Gasset. This, he was part of the Spanish Republic uh, before Franco took over. And he wrote a book called The Revolution of the Masses. It's a very small, little short book. But his theory in that book was that if we do not have an educated citizenry, then what we have is mob rule. If we do not have an educated citizenry, then we have mob rule. So when we have a low quality of education and so many of our young people, especially our kids of color who are becoming the majority in this country, if they're not given that kind of a proper education, then what does it say not only about their future, but what does it say about our future as a country? You know, there are like 50,000 Latino kids that turn 18 every month in the United States of America. 50,000, that's a big number every single month. But if these kids are not getting an education, what's going to happen to them? And we know that the, well, the, the, the people that go to prison, that when we can see that there is actually a correlation uh, between the fact that they did not get an education and that's why they end up in prison. Where are they going to go? There's no jobs. The military and jail are probably the only places that they can go. And when we think that here in our United States of America, we have more people in prison here in the United States of America. Our population are only millions, but we have more people in prison than India or China. And those populations are billions of, pe billions of people. We're only millions, but we have more people in prison uh, than those other countries have. So this makes it very, very scary. And when we think of the discrimination, and, and like Al Sharpton said, I remember once he said, you know, they turn in their hoods, you know, for the suits. And, and uh, this, it, this racism that we have is so institutionalized and the, and the lynching continues. The lynching continues, but it's now done by police. So we have Oscar Grant here in Oakland, of course. You know, we have Michael Brown in, in Ferguson, and on and on and on. And this is happening all over the country, uh, where we see young uh, black and brown young people that are getting killed by police, and, and with impunity, because many of them are not going uh, to jail for any of these uh, killings that is happening. So this really uh, presents a crisis, and so we have to figure out how we're gonna be able to answer this. And of course, one of the ways that we have to do it is just with knowledge, with knowledge. And we know that we do not have the corporate media on our side uh, because they are not telling the, pe the people the truth about what is, what is going on right now. And when we think about education, there's so much that we have to do. I think of education is like a diamond. You know, it's a diamond and it's, it's brilliant and it's got so many facets to it. But the other things that we have to think about education is we have to make sure eventually, and this is I think a vision that all of us have to work for, that we can have in every single school from kindergarten through 12th grade ethnic studies, right? <laughs> ethnic studies. Because part of the ignorance that we have in our society, well, again, again because the racism continues, is because people do not know what the contributions are of people of color, or of women, or of the labor movement. They don't know this. I was, uh, I was with Terry McCullough, who was elected uh, to the governorship in uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, and we were having a reception the night that he got elected, and uh, he made the statement, in Richmond, Virginia, right here, this is the oldest governor's mansion in the United States of America. And it was built by Thomas Jefferson. And I thought, uh-uh, it was built by his slaves. <laughs> it wasn't like Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and so, and so how, many, how many people you know, know that? How many people know that, that not only was that mansion, the oldest mansion in the United States, but the Congress of the United States and the White House were built by African slaves? How many, how many people know that? They don't. 
I mean, that is the ignorance that we have in our country. Uh, people don't know what the contributions have been, not only of the uh, African slaves that were brought here in bondage, but also of the Mexicans that came and they built the railroads and, and they worked the fields and the Asians that came here also, the Chinese uh, that worked the lands and built the railroads and uh, the Japanese and the Filipinos that were, came here. And we had these uh, uh, ex oriental exclusion laws that they could not even marry Caucasians. And like the Filipino brothers, all of those that were in Delano, many of them died without ever having a chance to get married because it was illegal for them to get married when they were brought here as young men. And people don't know this. So if we do not put this into our school books with children with, from the time that they're very small, you know, and, all, and they don't have, shouldn't have to wait until they go to college. Because if we don't do that, then our own uh, kids of color, they don't know what the contributions of their people have been to the society. And then our white children, they really think, oh man, we did it all, right? You know, they, that's where the whole essence of white privilege comes from, because they don't know what the contributions of people have been. And even when we think of Native Americans, you know, how often do we think, okay, th th we are standing on the land of Native Americans. Have we ever thanked them? I mean, I think we should have a law, Barbara. You'd be the one to do it. Introduce a bill into the Congress. That <laughs> yeah, that every Native American child should have a free education to any college of their choice in the country, and any child, African American child, who is a descendant of slaves, should also have the same privilege. You know, the way to make it happen. So uh, ethnic studies is one, and the other thing, we have to take over the school boards, okay? We have to take over all the school boards so that we can make sure that the tax dollars that we get are going to where they should be. And so I just I want to urge everybody. By the way, in our community organizing that we're doing with these uh, immigrant parents I've been speaking about, they have already uh, gotten themselves elected to five different school boards, okay? <laughs> gotten themselves elected to five different school boards. And the other thing I think we have to work for is free education for every single person in the United States of America. Right now, the statistics are that student debt is of what, $1.2 trillion? This is what students, so in fact, right now the, the economics of that are that uh, college students can't even afford to buy homes anymore because they have so much uh, money that they owe in debt uh, for, for, the, for going to college. And you know, when we think about why we, as the richest country in the world, why shouldn't we have free education? Think of Cuba. Cuba is a little teeny country. We have an economic blockade on Cuba. People are very, very poor because of this economic blockade that we have on that small country. But every single person in Cuba has a free college education and free medical care. Every single person. So if Cuba can do it, there's no reason why we in the United States uh, cannot do it. And there's other countries, of course, the Scandinavian countries, those, I'll say the word, S word, socialist. <laughs> the socialist countries, so they, have, they have education for all of their citizens also, and also free medical care. So, uh, you know, we think that we're so great, but we still have a long way to go. And, uh, and I want to talk about another, uh, point of ignorance, you know, we, uh, we know that uh, President Obama has just come out and he said that he's going to uh, give a, an executive action, take an executive action uh, to see how some of our undocumented uh, persons in our country, that they don't have to have that fear of deportation, that they can have some kind of work permits, especially uh, people who have children that are citizens of the United States. And when people ever ask, okay, why do people come to the United States of America? Actually, we passed an amnesty bill back in 1986, and many people uh, got their legalization at that time, but then something else happened. There was another bill that was passed, and it was the NAFTA, the Free Trade Agreements. What happened when that was passed? You know, well, one of the things that happened is the people in Oaxaca and Chiapas, the, the farmers over there, they knew that this was going to hurt them, and they had these huge demonstrations uh, against NAFTA. In the United States, we didn't even know what's going on. The only people that knew were the labor unions. Well, what happened when NAFTA passed it allowed American companies to go into Mexico, into Central America, and set up their businesses over there. The, I call it economic colonization. And so we think of the corn, the maize. The corn comes from Mexico. That's where the, the corn started. But right now, the people in Mexico, they, they actually import more corn to Mexico from the United States than what they grow in Mexico. 
And because we subsidize our corn to make it cheap. And so the small campesino farmer over there, he cannot compete with the United States. So these are the people that come north. When we talk about the 11 million undocumented, a huge part of that number are these small campesino farmers from Mexico that are put out of business by American corn and by NAFTA. And then we have the big box stores like, like Walmart. By the way, friends don't let their friends shop at Walmart, okay? <laughs> so these big box stores go over there. And then they, they, put, the, they put all this, uh, the small mom and, mom and uh, pop uh, shops out, out of business also. And so what are people going to do? They're going to come north. And we, and we have to see what, what we do different with Latin America than what we did with uh, Japan and, uh, and Germany after World War II. We defeated those countries, but then we lent them millions and millions of dollars to rebuild their economies. So we have Sony, Mitsubishi, we have Volkswagen, and these corporations became strong with American dollars. We didn't go over there and take over their economy the way that we do with Latin America. And you know, when people in Latin America, they don't like what we do, I mean, and they, they don't want to cooperate with, with this kind of a, a free trade agreements that we have, then we don't like them. We don't like them. Like Hugo Chavez, we made him our enemy. And why? Because he had this really strange idea. He believed that the oil of Venezuela belonged to the people of Venezuela. And Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, he says the natural gas of Bolivia belongs to the people of Bolivia. So think about this. We are the only developed country in the world that does not own our natural resources. Think about that. When you think of every time you pay your, your phone bill to AT&T, and what is his salary, yearly salary? About 16 million a year, okay? When you pay your, your phone bill for your iPad or your or, or your iPhone, okay? So things that are here, you know, things are kind of not, kind of not the way that they should be, but these are things that we have to think about for the future. And when we think about immigration and about this whole idea of economic colonization, how many bananas have we eaten every day in the United States of America? Millions of bananas. Now, do, do the people in Guatemala and Honduras, do they get that money? No, they don't get that money. Who gets the money? Dole, Chiquita Banana. American corporations, the people whose land the bananas are grown on and the people that produce the bananas, they don't get the money. And so this is why they come to the United States. And when all of those children were there at the border, you know, when they were talking about all these children from Central America, you know what? We have a debt to those countries. Remember we were bombing El Salvador? We were bombing those countries? They came to collect on that debt. That's what they were doing. They came here to collect on that debt. So these are things for us to think about in the terms of how we're going to go with our country in the future, that we've got to be able to give people knowledge. And, uh, and we have to think, of course, of elections. We talked about elections before, and elections are so, so important. You know, by passing Proposition 30, we got money into our school systems and money into our healthcare systems. And the good thing about Proposition 30, not only did we get that $6 billion plus, we're gonna get, next year we're gonna, you're gonna get another $6 billion, right? in the year after that, and that will help us in terms of, uh, of our economy. In this last election, we passed Proposition, Proposition 47. What did that do? Proposition 47 reduces the felonies, reduces felonies so that we can, uh, so many people will not have to go to prison. If it's a kind of a, a misdemeanor crime, they shouldn't have to go to prison and call it a felony. And it, it will release some people from prison and make it possible for less people uh, to go to prison in the future. Uh, but these are the things that we can do, but we've got to be engaged. We've got to be engaged. And uh, it's more than, and I'm gonna ask the question here, how many of you people voted in the last election? Let me see your hands, everybody, okay? Now I'm gonna ask you another one. How many of you people here, present today, how many of you put your tennis shoes on, went out and knocked on doors, or did phone banking in this last election? See, our numbers dropped a lot. So this is what I'm going to ask everybody. Could you please, for future elections, not only go out there and vote, but go out there and help people register to vote, go out there and knock on doors to get people? I'm, like you said, I'm 84 years old. I, I want you to know that I was out there knocking on doors in this last election. OK, I put on my shoes, I was out there doing that. Because if we don't really go out there and do the work, it's, it's, it's not going to change. 
we are really, really in a crisis. And you know, when we see all of these attacks that they have against women's right to choose, the attacks on immigrants, the attacks on our LGBTQ community, uh, what, what is the, the attacks on labor unions? This is a distraction because they're attacking uh, all of the uh, people that they feel that they can somehow uh, you know, get some traction on to take away from the real issues. And what are the real issues? The economy. The fact that you have 400 individuals in our United States here that have more wealth than 1,500,000 people. 400 individuals that have more wealth than 1,500,000 people. So that is a real issue, the economic issues. When they talk about raising the minimum wage, yay, we're gonna raise it to maybe $15 an hour. But if the minimum wage were where it should be, it should be $30 an hour. You should be $30 an hour. So I really think that the only way that we can, uh, you know, face up to this crisis is to continue to organize, to do the kind of grassroots organizing uh, that Cecil and I did when we started the Farm Workers Union, uh, the same kind of organizing that we're doing now with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. We know that there's not very many resources for that, but we have to remember the change always comes uh, from the bottom. The civil rights movement, the peace movement, the uh, women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, you know, it all comes from the bottom. And so that's the way that we have to make it happen. And people have got to uh, get, devote some of their time uh, to, and some of their resources to make it happen. Uh, because if not, uh, it's not going to get any better. It's actually going to get worse. And we have to look for those sources of where we can get the news. You know, Listen to John, uh, Colbert and John Stewart, right? Amy Goodman, you know? These are the pe uh, people, places that we have to go to uh, because uh, unfortunately our corporate media uh, is not very helpful. And Rachel Maddow, of course, on MSNBC. Uh, so, and whatever we learn, well, then we have to share it. And so, even though it seems very difficult, we know we do have new tools, we do have uh, the social media right now, we have, you know, the emails, and we have the internet, we have Twitter, Instagram, and all of these uh, uh, other kinds of mediums so that uh, uh, we can uh, definitely get the word out. Uh, about the things that we are learning. And, uh, and then let's remember the people, you know, when we talk about, about uh, education, remember the past, remember the people who sacrificed their lives uh, for the movement. Uh, when people don't want to register to vote, let's remind them of the people that were killed in the South when people were trying to, to get registered. Uh, Schwerner, Goodman, Cheney, and I was with, yesterday I was with this wonderful woman who was, uh, her, mo her mother got killed also in the South. And people don't even know about her. her name is Viola, yeah, Viola Lucchese. And uh, she left five children behind her, and she was killed. So we can, t and we can talk about the martyrs in the farm workers movement. You know, the people that were killed in the farm workers movement. Our first martyr was a young Jewish girl, Nan Friedman, who was killed in Florida. Our second martyr was an Arab, Najid Daifala, who was killed in, uh, by, by a sheriff. Uh, our, our next martyr was uh, Rufino Contreras, who was mailed, who was, uh, met with a hail of 80 bullets as he walked into a field to talk to strike breakers. And then our next uh, martyr was uh, Juan de la Cruz, who was shot on the picket line. And then Rene Lopez, a young man uh, who organized his company uh, to work for the union, to vote for the union. And after the election, they called him over to a car, said, Rene, we want to talk to you. He put his head to the window of the car. They pulled out, pulled out a gun and shot him in the temple. And all of this just so that workers could get the basic rights of having toilets in the fields, cold drinking water, unemployment insurance is the right to organize. But I know all of us here that are in this uh, hall tonight, that we're all dedicated. We're all dedicated, we're gonna keep on working, we're gonna continue that journey, and we're going to, we're going to get there eventually. You know, we will see a day uh, when we will have peace, and we will have justice for everyone and everybody. We can share the resources of, of our world and our planet and not always think about dominance and competition. Uh, we can make a better world. And uh, to get rid of racism, uh, I just wanna, again, talking about science. And I love to ask this question whenever I go and speak at different uh, colleges and uh, community organizations. I ask the question, what is the name of our human race? Students, shout it out. Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, okay? And where did our human race begin? Africa. Africa, right? And so our human race traveled across the planet. Uh, they went to Asia, people got lighter in skin, came down to the Bering Strait to the Americas. 
and one of our tribes got totally lost, and they went way up north where it's really cold, and they lost their color, completely lost their color. <laughs> so now they have to go to the beach at the tanning salon to get their color back. <laughs> so what, what this really means, you know, again, knowledge and science, we are all Africans of different shades and colors. So we can say to the Ku Klux Klan and to the White Citizens Council and to those uh, lost people in the Tea Party, get over it, you Africans. Just get over it, okay? <laughs> and so uh, uh, to remind us uh, that uh, we are all one human family, uh, there is a Zulu word that I want to share with you, and it's from South Africa. And it means we, the people, are coming together to fight for justice. And the word is Wozani. Can we say that word? Wozani. Okay, so I'm going to say one, two, three, and I want us to shout it all together as loud as we can that we are dedicating ourselves here to continue the journey and we're going to fight for justice. And so I'll say one, two, three, let's all shout Wozani at the top of our. Wait, wait, wait for me, wait for me, wait for me. We have to do it together. We have to be organized, okay? So we have to be organized. Let's go. So I'll say one, two, three, and we'll all shout Wozani at the top of our lungs, okay? One, two, three! Wozani! That is awesome. And we have to remember that we have got the power. And we were starting to organize farm workers, people would say to us, how are you going to organize them? And the people that we organized with the Dolores, Dolores with the Foundation, we have to say to them, you have the power. And they say, well, we're poor. You know, we don't speak English. We don't have any money. What power do we have? And what we say, the power is in your person. The power is in your person. And this is all the power that you need. But we know that we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We've got to come together. We've got to work together. We've got to weave all of our movements together. And that is the way that we're going to win and that we're going to change. And I don't care how much money they have, the Koch brothers and the Andelsons and all these other people, when it comes right down to it, the votes are the ones that make the difference, and the people are the ones that make the difference. We've got, to, we've got to remember that, and we've got to preach that, and we've got to dedicate ourselves to make it happen. And so I'm going to ask you all a question. I'm going to ask you who's got the power, and I want you to say, we've got the power, okay? And, and yell that out really loud, too. Who's got the power? We have the power. And I'm going to say, what kind of power? You say, people power. What kind of power? People power. Who's got the power? We have what kind of power? power? Well, and then if we all work together, we can make it happen with great leadership like we, that we have here, with Barbara's leadership, Ella Hughes' Bar leadership, Art's leadership, our great leaders here at Mills College, we can make it happen. So let's put our hands up together. We're going to say, si sí, se puede, yes we can. Let's go. Si sí, se puede. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Heaven, my. 